There is a click followed by silence from the MC announcing boxes when someone pulls the 4MC talk switch. The 4MC will interrupt all communications on that circuit, causing the click sound. But the 4MC is only heard in a few spaces like control, maneuvering, and the boardroom, among others. This click from the MC box outside birthing woke me immediately. The muffled sound of the 4MC announcement sounded distant, garbled, and unintelligible. The announcement ended. I had no idea what was said, so I just waited. A long moment passed before the 1MC came alive. Lube oil rupture in the engine room. Lube oil rupture in the engine room. Then the general alarm sounded. Bong, bong, bong. I rolled out of my rack on top of someone below me who was getting his uniform on. Getting out of his way, I threw my poopy suit on. That's an underway jumpsuit uniform. And stepped into my boots. The general alarm ended and the 1MC barked. Lube oil rupture in the engine room. Engine room lower level. Rig ship for fire and general emergency. What time was it? I was, was I oncoming or off going? I was either the hosemen or the wipe down team, depending on what time it was. I checked my G-Shock watch and did some half-ass sub subtraction. I had the mid watch tonight and it was 1900. So I was oncoming. That meant I was wipe down team. Go to cruise mess. I stumbled past crewmen getting dressed and got out of birthing. People were already moving aft with fire extinguishers. I moved out of their way as I moved forward. This was not a drill and people had a little extra urgency in their movements. The leak has been isolated, came the follow-up call. I took a seat in crew's mess. The cob was already there. He was the man in charge. The cook chief was his phone talker. He was already relaying information into his mouthpiece. The fire teams were dressing out in the fire protective suits. I got off my ass and I helped one of them finish. We would not be sending anyone in the oxygen breathing apparatuses, OBA, into a lube oil leak because the heat that it radiated may catch it on fire. But if a fire did break out, these guys would be the first ones to go in. The executive officer is the man in charge at the scene, the 1MC announced, his voice muffled by his breathing mask. Where's the wipe down team, the cob asked. I raised my hand with my sonar watch section who made it into cruise mess. Lay it to DC Central. Yes, Cobb, I replied, getting everybody out of cruise mess. We arrived at D Damage Control Central in missile compartment upper level. Get into your anti sea suits. You're going in, the man in charge ordered. My sonar watch section began donning the white plastic weave hazmat suits. This lightweight liquid repellent suit was loose fitting and zipped up the front from crotch to neck. There was a hood that came over our heads with an elastic seal opening for our faces. Blue baggy booties covered our steel toed boots. I felt like I was going into ET's house or making silicon wafers at IBM. The final touch was putting on an EAB, an emergency air breathing apparatus. It's a rubber full face gas mask with a six foot air hose attached to a belt clip regulator. We use these EABs to breathe in the compartment with smoke or toxic gases. The five foot air hose allowed us limited mobility from the EAB air manifolds in the overhead around the submarine. We grabbed white clear trash bags and super absorbent oil soaking pads from the DC lockers and lined up at the watertight door ready to enter the engine room. The man in charge took down our names. He kept a written tally of every person in the engine room during the casualty. Go, he said. The watertight door opened and I stepped into the hot engine room. The air was not moving. All the fans had been shut down. We were in the top level of a three level engine room. The visibility through my face piece was good. There wasn't any immediate visible sign of a problem. I took a deep breath and unplugged my EAB hose and moved quickly, not running, but a rapid walk towards the next EAB manifold. We were required to memorize these EAB locations during qualification because you can't breathe when your ho air hose is not plugged into the manifold and I was thankful I knew where each one was. It helped me stay calm knowing I could get a breath of air within the next few feet. At the aluminum ladder to middle level is where I noticed problems. The fire hose was flaked out and pressurized. The nozzle men knelt at the ready to flood the engine room with water if need be. I unplugged my EAB and moved down the ladder. I slipped down the last few steps that they were covered in oil. Trash bags and absorbent pads flew everywhere as I fell. I picked myself back up and plugged into an air manifold. Taking a deep breath, I collected myself and things. It was quiet back here. This was the quietest I had heard the engine room since port. The main engines were making a slow hum as they ran at slow speed. 
Other small essential pumps hummed and whirled quietly. The sub was running at a reduced capacity. She was injured. Sweat was running down my face when I got to the next ladder. Oil vapor was visible now and collecting on the outside of my face mask. Amber translucent fog collected in droplets around the air. The oil leak had began under pressure and vaporized the oil into the air when it spewed out. The severity of the casualty was apparent. That oil vapor could catch fire if it came into contact with a hot enough surface. I tried not to think about the fog becoming a wave of red-orange flame that ran through the boat. It would cook every sailor back here like a furnace. My five-man wipe-down team had queued up behind me now, and I climbed down to lower level very carefully. Wipe-down team is here, man in charge, I reported. Wait here, he replied. A pressurized fire hose was being used to knock down the fog into the bilge. The nozzle man was using short, wide-angle burst every few seconds to knock down swaths of the fog. The water and oil were being collected and pumped overboard by the drain system. We stood there watching them work, oil condensed on our hazmat suits clinging it to our uniforms. My mind wondered if the oil flashed to the fire would overpressurize the engine room, crushing us all into jelly before burning our bodies. At least that would be quick. Maybe it would happen before I realized anything was wrong. I always imagined I might drown in the Navy, but it was but fire was terrifying. I didn't want to burn to death. Please don't let that be the way this ends. Okay, start cleaning up the mess, the XO ordered as the hose man moved into the next section of the engine room. The oil and water covered everything. Metal pipes, ventilation ducts, outboard insulation, everything was soaked. One of my guys used his knife to cut out saturated sections of insulation around the outboard frames. The rest of us placed dark, super absorbent pads over everything, letting it sit for a few minutes while it did their work before collecting them into clear plastic trash bags. It was exhausting work in the heat of the engine room without air circulation. I lost track of time as we moved forward to aft from one oil soaked section to another. My body was drenched with sweat. My uniform was covered in oil on top of my hazmat coveralls. My mind kept wondering when the flame would come. Would I feel the breeze of a pressure wave before the fire engulfed us all? For hours, we went through hundreds of oil pads, thousands of chem wipes, all stored in dozens of trash bags. Eventually, the order was made to ventilate the engine room and sweet, cool air came out of the vents. And for the first time, I allowed myself to think I might survive this. Eventually, the call was made to exit the engine room and report to the decontamination station. Soaked and exhausted, the five of us shuffled out of the engine room, stripped out of our ruined clothes. I'd never use that poopy suit again. Somehow the oil had managed to get past the hazmat suit and into everything. And I mean everything. We showered thoroughly and got a quick checkup by the corpsman. And when it was over, we walked back to my rack and I just passed out. The cleanup in the engine room was continuous over the next few days as we made our way back to port. Tiger teams of watch standards would clean up oil as their watch instead of doing their normal duties. After watch, we would also spend an extra hour in the engine room ripping out any more lagging that was soaked with oil and wiping up surfaces that still collected puddles of this uh, lubricant. The worst casualty of the lube oil rupture was the nuclear watch stander who reported it. He had climbed up into Shaft Alley and jumped down on top of this large isolation valve to stop the spray of scalding oil. He severely burnt his face and both of his hands in this process, but he probably saved the ship. He was medevac the next day, as soon as we could get a helicopter. I still have vivid flashbacks of this event. It's something I deal with regularly. Suddenly, I find myself in the engine room with a wall of fire coming at me. Uh, sometimes I'm quiet as the fire washes over me. Sometimes I cry out as it happens. And just as suddenly I'm back to reality, you know, standing in my kitchen over the sink with the water running or in my garage on a hot Florida day with the sun baking the unmoving air, some, anything like that, that triggers the memory. Sometimes it happens in public and that's the worst. Uh, it's awkward to feel the stare of strangers after I've just shouted no in the produce section of the grocery store. But that's why they call this service.